I want to introduce uh, Roy Moran to you. Many of you know Roy already. Um, he's the, the director of the North America New Generations team, but also the chairman of the board for um, New Generations. And Roy has been just uh, had a huge impact on so many of our lives. And I want him to come up here and uh, I'll give him a round of applause. Thank you, David. How about them chiefs? No, okay. <laughs> That's what happens when you have the microphone. <laughs> hey, thanks for being here. David, Lissa, uh, thank you guys for all the work that you've done to make this happen. Let's, let's recognize the Phoenix team. You guys want to stand up? Phoenix team? You want to stand up? I'm, I apologize for those of you online. You can't see anything. Hey. Yeah, there's... We realize you have a lockdown shot here of the stage, but uh, it'll get better in a minute. Um, the uh, emir of the white or the pink people will be up here, um, <laughs> better known as Harry Brown. So uh, it, it'll get much better sooner here. But uh, I want to introduce a few people in the room um, that are, are pretty significant in my life. Um, we have uh, the New Generations Global Field Team leader here with us, Yunusa Jow. Many hours of coffee, he finally got through to me and, uh, and helped me reshape my understanding of what it is like to uh, fulfill a great commission through disciple making. So, Yunusa, thanks for being here and being a part of this. We're going to hear from him tomorrow morning. Um, and it, it, it may not, you may not realize it, but uh, a lot of our African brothers um, have a real heart for the U.S. And, and pray regularly for what we're doing here. Uh, they just... Uh, ha have a unique passion, and I love being with them, and I love being prayed for by them, uh, because there's just something mystical about their their desire to see the gospel break free in this country. So, uh, let me introduce a, a few of, uh, of the the team that uh, exists for New Generations. About three years ago, uh, or f maybe four years ago, we were sitting in my living room. Uh, the global team was in Kansas City, and I think, uh, you know, any, anytime we have a meeting, um, if you ever, ever want to have a meeting and you want to have an agenda that is e extremely impressive, you should call Harry Brown, because he can, he can build an agenda for a meeting that will choke an elephant, okay? <laughs> and, <laughs> And we give him a hard time for this, but uh, so anyway, we're in the middle of that agenda. I, I believe it was you, Yanusa, who who uh, brought onto the table that we should treat North America as a region and that we needed to get after it now in, in North America. And so when we say North America, we mean the U.S. and Canada. Um, and so, uh, Yunusa, thanks so much for doing that. Unfortunately, uh, I was the only North American in the room. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's all, all I had to choose from, you know, and when all you have is one, it's not hard to make that choice. Uh, so, uh, but uh, it, it's, it was a delight to, to see that team uh, begin to understand how important it would be to see the gospel expand in this country and in Canada. And so we started uh, dividing the country up and beginning to treat it just like uh, our brothers and sisters around the world in South Asia, Southeast Asia have. And so I want to introduce to you some of the, the the uh, directors or the area uh, coordinators of these areas. So Tom, Tom Marshall, where are you? Tom's, oh, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you the states. You can ask Tom. He knows them. He's got a mirror. But Tom's in, in, over the Pacific states. So whatever that means. All right. <laughs> David Hinman in the southwest. The mountain states, Jeff Crabtree. Uh, yours truly in the Midwest, sort of I-35 up and down, yeah. So, so Jim Egley, where are you? Jim Egley. Jim's, Jim's got the, the Great Lakes. If a state touches the Great Lakes, Jim's got it, all right? All right. So uh, Jim Baumgartner, have you made it here yet? Oh, there he is, Jim. Jim's in our southeast. He's our newest reach area, area coordinator. Jim's recently returned. Uh, from the mission field and uh, just didn't miss a beat. He, he hit, his, hit the ground running here in the U.S. and, and he's now engaged in, in, in our team. And then um, Northeast, 
Larry Filbert. Have I missed anybody, Jim? Chris. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> Geography-wise. Geography-wise. I'm missing by having. All right, so we have two other coordinators. Um, Chris Ophus coordinates our Spanish-speaking area. I know he doesn't look Spanish, but if you hear him speak Spanish and you have your eyes closed and you know Spanish, you would not realize he wasn't Spanish. He's, uh, he's one of those, those people that just uh, gets involved, and he lives in uh, an incredible place in Chicago, and if you ever visit there, uh, Little Mexico, Little Village, it is Little, Me we have Little Mexico in Kansas City, so, yeah, so, uh, but uh, Chris is helping us uh, really focus in on how do we engage Spanish-speaking cop populations in North America, and then he's not here yet, he's on his way, he's a, a, uh, Maybe it was the ice storm that killed him, or maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe he just missed his flight. But anyway, Sunil um, Gakwad, did I say that right? Sort of right? Sunil is focusing on South Asians for us in the, the North American region. Sunil will be here in the morning. Uh, he lives in Chicago as, as well. So tonight, uh, I, I wanted us to kick off uh, very similar to the way we kicked off a meeting in Nairobi uh, a couple of months ago, back in September, all right? And um, it was a New Generations Global Family Gathering. So this is really a New Generations North American Family Gathering. So uh, to do that, I want to tell you about my family, okay? So let me show you a picture of my family. All right, could you hit it again, maybe in, oh, that's okay, leave it, leave it right there. So this is my family, I have four children, uh, Colin Moran, my youngest child, and Trevor Moran, my oldest son, all right? And then I have two daughters, Alyssa Sanders, my oldest daughter, and Jesse, S Jesse Mitchell, my youngest daughter. Now, what's interesting about them is they're all family. They all share the same genes. They're all family, but they have different names. And as we come to this gathering, we come flying under different banners, different logos, different, different things. But the fact is, is that we come because we, we have some DNA that is embedded in all of us. We're focused in on obedience-based, discovery-focused, multiplicative disciple-making. And that draws us together and allows us to forget about the logos and egos and realize that, that we're family no matter what label or name we go under. And so I'm excited tonight to kick off this the same way we kicked off our global family gathering by having Harry Brown come and share with us. Now, Harry uh, is, is a, a dear friend. We have, have been in the trenches for quite some time together, and he is a mentor. Um, he's a coach. Uh, he, he has taught me uh, as much about uh, disciple making and multiplicative disciple making and movements as, as any other human being. Um, and we have a strange and wonderful relationship. Um, you know the joke, right? <laughs> He's strange, I'm wonderful, no. Um, so I'm the chairman of the board. So there are times when I'm really Harry's boss, and I'm also the North American Regional Director. And there's times when he's my boss. And so he and I dance a lot. Uh, around this thing, but it's a beautiful dance that God has brought together, and uh, I, I trust him with my life. Uh, I've, I've never met another human being who has no guile like Harry Brown. Uh, he just has, he is just a selfless individual, and I am privileged uh, to call him my leader at New Generation. So, Harry, come up and share with us. Thank you, Roy. Um, unworthy, but thank you. Um, I need to take a quick check here. Um, how many pastors are in the room? Uh, okay, good. So in just a second, we're going to have a moment of silence, and one of you needs to volunteer to conduct the funeral for the 49ers. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, Roy and I are on the other side of this issue. And he has yet to realize that the last time they played in the Super Bowl, they won by cheating. Uh, <laughs> and it was 
pretty evident to all, but he hasn't accepted that yet. But over time, we, we believe that eventually he'll come around to that. So anyway, um, it is just a pleasure and a joy to be with you guys. I, I just rejoice to see you out here. And as, as we get going, or before we get into the content, I, I want to set the tone for what's going to happen here. And I'm going to do that by doing my best interpretation of an African parable that I learned from one of our teammates, Ila Tassi, who is in Nairobi, Kenya. He's not here tonight. But he, he taught me this parable, and I've spoken it often because it just captures so much of what the tone needs to be. And like most good African parables, it involves animals. So there's a story here about an ant and an elephant. Now the ant is on a journey and he comes to a raging river and he can't get across. He doesn't know what to do. Then the elephant comes along and he says, hey, will you take me across? The elephant said, no problem. So the ant crawled up, got up on top of the back of the elephant. The elephant plunged into the raging river. The ant got scared. He was afraid even the splash would take him off. So up onto the head and to the tip of the trunk he went and the elephant just powered right through, undeterred by the river because of his great strength. And they got to the other side, and the ant yelled in jubilation, we did it! We did it together! <laughs> and the point of the parable is that God is the elephant and we are the ant. So if, in fact, you hear a story that's compelling or hear about numbers that are big, it's because the elephant is the center of the story and the ant is along for the ride. So, setting the tone there. So now, here's the question for tonight. Why are we here? It's not because they're offering dinner, because they're not. <laughs> and the snacks are a little... So why are we here tonight? Well, we're here to do three things from my perspective. We're here to celebrate the kingdom advance that God is granting. And my wife and I have been in full-time ministry for like 48 years. Now you know we're old. And there was about a time when like 30 years ago, so 18 years more or less into it, where I'm reading the scripture. And I came across 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. It's Paul praying for the Thessalonians. And he's got this beautiful prayer of all the things he wants to happen for them. And it gets to this crescendo. And at this crescendo, he prays this. That you would experience the work of faith with power. As I read that, I stopped. I probably read it a dozen times, maybe a hundred times. But it just caught my attention in a new way. And I thought to myself, something in the range of 18 or 20 years into full-time ministry, have I ever seen it, let alone participated in it? And the answer was no. i have been involved in all kinds of things that were nice. Nothing not to like. Some very good stories. You can write your monthly prayer letter. It's all good, right? But did it qualify for the work of faith with power? The answer was no. And I stopped right there. And I said, God, someday, let me be involved in the work of faith with power. I want that to be part of my experience, part of my story. And God has honored that prayer, that I and we are involved in the work of faith with power. Jesus promised, John 14, 12, that you are going to do greater works than I did. What a shocking statement. And he said that to the many, not to the ones or the twos. And he's proving his word to be true. Because the works that I do, he said, greater works you will do. What was the work that he was doing? He was catalyzing the launch of a chain reaction of disciples that started with a whole bunch of really unlikely candidates and continued on to, as the scriptures say, turn the world upside down. And those greater works are ongoing. And we get to participate in that. We're here to celebrate the amazing results that God has been bringing. In the last about 18 years, since March 2005, when we started doing disciple-making movements and we began to track from that time to this, God has raised up 103,000 new churches. And they comprise 2.1 million followers of Jesus. And those are the net numbers after you take all the stuff that, you, that died or the stuff you can't find. 
If you do the math on that, it comes out to 15 new churches each and every day for the last 18 years and 335 new followers of Jesus. And all of them were born with a reproductive DNA. You start to think about that and what it means. It becomes awe-inspiring of what God, the elephant in the store, the parable, is choosing to do and what we get to participate in. Right now, New Generations is shepherding 168 movements by a definition of at least 100 new churches. That's the minimum. That have multiplied to at least four generations of churches planting churches. Of the 168, there's 65 of them that are now between 10 and 30 generations of churches planting churches. Why is that such a big deal? It's not because it's a big number. It's because we don't have any money or any management past generation five, six, or seven. So if it's getting to 10, to 15, to 20, to 25, to 30, and beyond, what does it mean? It means that the DNA is there for it to keep going, keep its quality, and here's the kicker, and do it without you. <laughs> because if you cannot say without you, you're simply not having a Great Commission conversation. And these things are proving that it's true and it can be done. Because most people don't believe that. They'll sit in pews and listen to sermons that say, yay, it's all going to happen. And everybody claps and nobody believes it. It's time to believe it again. Because the Great Commission is actually practically possible when you can catalyze things that keep going without you. We're here to celebrate that. We're also here to celebrate the ordinary people that God is using to make this true. Because our premise, our conviction, is the only way to complete the Great Commission is when ordinary people are multiplying disciples in their natural networks. Because the devil himself has sold us a lie that we bought wholesale, that it's all about the few winning the many instead of the many winning a few and getting them to repeat the process. So we've leveraged everything on the stuff that is big and said that's the answer. And all the facts say no, it's not. Because here's the truth. Big wows. And we love wow. But little wins. And here's another truth. The ants move more than elephants. You know why? Because there's a bunch of them. And they're all working all the time. And they do it without anybody telling them what to do. It's who they are. So they're all picking up little specks of stuff and moving mountains. You want to move a boulder? You get yourself an elephant. You want to move a mountain? You call the ants because they can get the job done. That's what God is doing through ordinary people. I'll tell you a story of one of them. Her name is Margaret. She's an ordinary person that lives in Kenya. Margaret has never been to school. She didn't know how to read or write, but she wanted to go to the DMM training, and so she did. And she listened, and she learned, and she got her kids to read and repeat so she could really grasp it. Then she said, oh, guess what? I'm gonna do it. What a novel idea. Actually acting on the training you received. We should try that sometime. <laughs> That's what Margaret did. She began to apply it. This illiterate, uneducated woman started doing discovery Bible studies among her people group, a tribe called the Turkana. And guess what? It worked. And as she began to plant these discovery Bible studies, she got 12 of them going. And then the 12 did what they were designed to do. They started maturing into churches. So he's got four generations of churches planning churches that came from her work in launching Discovery Bible Studies. Then she sat down and said, I think I'll retire. No, she didn't. <laughs> what she did is she poured gas on the fire. She got 12 different DMM groups that she was the catalyst for to repeat the process without her. And guess what? It worked. Now she's got all of this momentum going among the Turkana, and she looked to the horizon and said, ah, 
we need to go to the Pokwat. Unfortunately, the Pokwat were the blood enemies of the Shukana. They've been fighting forever. All they want to do is fight and kill each other. And she says, no, we need to go. Everybody said, you could die doing this. She said, God will protect me. So she engaged, found the person of peace, and that person of peace did what they were supposed to do, which was gathered spiritually interested, like-minded people. And because of her coaching, it began to take root and multiply there. She said, God will protect me, and he did. And she said, I learned to de defeat my fear because I saw what God could do. This is the story of an ordinary woman that didn't get paid to do this, didn't have the credential, didn't have the profile, and yet she is going to be in the front of the line up in heaven for those to get their reward because she chose to obey and got friends and family to do the same and was willing to engage strangers and get them to repeat the process. We're here to celebrate those ordinary people. And we're here to celebrate the sovereign God who is making these things true in our day. Things that generations of people have prayed and cried and bled and died to see come true. Just like Hebrews 11, we have entered in to the framework and the foundation that they have laid. And God is choosing this time to begin to author a new era of his work upon the earth. And he's letting us participate in some of the early paragraphs of the next chapter of Acts. Think of that for a second. That is amazing. There's no big names in the room. That's how God likes to do things. He chooses the unlikely, the ones the world would never select, I'm a case in point, and says, hey, we've got something for you to do. And it's as simple as this. Do what I ask you to do and get other people to do the same. We're here to celebrate these things. We're also here for something else. We're here to begin to create harmony in the midst of diversity. You guys do not look all the same. You don't come from the same places. You don't have the same background. There's pretty significant diversity in this room. Now, take your mind down the trail that says, in all of my network and their network and theirs, multiplied by all the people in the room, how much diversity is in the discussion? Then take your head to six billion lost people, and you recognize the diversity is infinite. And you know what? God doesn't want to homogenize them because he decided that diversity would be for eternity. You know how we know? We read the end of the book. And what do we got? As the story's coming to a close, every people, nation, tribe, and tongue are there and will be there with that identity for all eternity. And how were they harmonized together? Because they have a greater identity that's rooted in being child of the king and ambassadors for the kingdom. And that superseded all of the diversity. And God designed it because he knew the world would scatter. And everybody knows somebody you don't, which is the key to getting everywhere it needs to be. It's through all of those diversities that God gives us opportunity to make sure that everybody has a quality chance to say yes to Jesus. We know that not all will, but that's not the point. The point is our job is to make sure that they have that opportunity. We're here to create harmony in that diversity. Now harmony, you get the idea of the symphony. All kinds of different instruments playing all kinds of different parts. And the guy up front with the little stick is getting them all to do it in such a way that it sounds really good because it's all fitting together. And that's what God has in the room. He has all kinds of different instruments that are going to do different things that all fit into the same piece of music. And it sounds beautiful because that's what it was designed to do. Our harmony is going to come 
because we share the same mission and we share the same values. We have a mission that says our purpose is to catalyze disciple-making movements everywhere. It's on that platform we stand. And on that platform, we have five values that we adhere to that create the heartbeat that allows us to walk together as one. Those five are first. We are God-directed. That means we do what the Father says at the micro and at the macro level. What's the micro level? Well, that would be me, but it's also you. It means the individual. The individual has to choose to obey every day in every way. And the collective, the organization, the ministry, whatever it is, they have to do the same. We are God-directed in all that we do. And that's one of those values that guides us together and keeps us together. And why do we do that? Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey. Cause and effect. No need for explanation. And no room for equivocation. It's not a negotiated compromise. If you love me, you will. Full stop. And that is God's love language. Obedience. So if we love him, we obey. Because we do what the Father says. We are God-directed. That's number one. Number two is we are replication-obsessed. Now, we put the word replication in there, not multiplication. You know why? Because in multiplication, the numbers get bigger. In replication, the process goes with them. Because what are we after? We're after long tail chain reactions where you can't see them over the horizon. You can count whatever you can find but if it's doing what it's supposed to do, it's going to keep going past where anybody can find it or count it. That's the whole idea. That is completely dependent on being replication obsessed. And why do we use such a strong word like obsessed? Because Psalm 105 says God's command to a thousand generations. Put that at the front of your head. Say, is that what I want? Do I want to be part of that? Forget if you're going to live to see it. That's not the point. The point is if you think that way, you're going to do everything differently at the beginning because you start like you want to finish. And if you want to get to a thousand generations in the legacy that you leave behind, that's represented in all the generations who pick up what you laid down and kept it going, then you have to be replication obsessed because if you're not obsessed, then human nature says everything drifts from day one. Everything and everybody. And if you don't have the fierce resolve, and if you don't have the passion inside of you to say, not on my watch, if you don't do that, then what you're going to have is something that's like a shooting star. It's very impressive for a short period of time, and then it's gone. And that cannot be. Therefore, as a value, something we hold dear, is that we are replication obsessed. The third value is that we're apostolically spirited. We want the gospel to be where it has never been, where it has never flourished. Now, the idea of an apostle, it's the same word as missionary. One sent on a mission, and what is the mission they're sent on to do? The apostle is designed by God to be a catalyst. And the idea of a catalyst is you make something happen that could not happen without you. That means if you sit down, they die for eternity. It cannot happen unless you fulfill your role. But, and this is a giant size but, make it all capital letters and make it blink red. But it's designed not to depend on you. And that's what so much of the missionary enterprise over the last 200 years has struggled with. For nobly sounding reasons, they stayed the hub of the wheel. And the net result is there was a low ceiling on what came out for the kingdom. In the main, it's not bad motives, but the result is the same. They weren't acting like a catalyst. A catalyst is something 
that is introduced once and brings permanent and pervasive change. That's what an apostle is supposed to do. And when to be apostolically spirited says, we're going to make sure that we make things happen that could not happen without us. We're also going to make equally sure that they're designed not to depend on us. Number four, the fourth value is to be locally led. The people that live in an area are going to lead in that area. I was with a brother in El Salvador who was from the village that we were in. And I was asking him, how did it go? How did the gospel come here? And what's the story? And he said, as part of his explanation, it was 100 years before the missionaries that brought us the gospel allowed any Salvadorian to have any meaningful leadership role. 100 years. That cannot be. The sovereign God has placed people in the middle of context that they reflect and have equity in and therefore have opportunity that no outsider could ever imagine. And he has designed and therefore he desires that they have the role of being able to bring the kingdom of God into the community of need. And our job is to give them the mindset the tools, the coaching, and encouragement so they can realize the destiny that God has given them in his perfect plan. And if we rob them of their birthright, we not only disenfranchise them, but we draw a circle around the kingdom impact that will come from that. This cannot be. So we have it as a value that it's locally led. That doesn't mean we don't have a role. It can't happen without you but it is designed not to depend on you. I learned this through a passage that's very famous and familiar to all of you. You'll know it when I start to quote it. But I never heard anybody speak it to its conclusion and unpack its implication. It's Isaiah chapter 61. It goes like this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor to bind up the brokenhearted, and to release the captives, and so it goes. Have you ever heard anybody tell you what is going to happen to those who've been redeemed and restored? Well, verse 3 does. They. Who's the they? The ones who've been redeemed and restored. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. You might have been part of the story, but God got it done the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. The picture of the oak is great strength and reproduction because oaks have acorns. Then verse 4 is the crescendo. It says they, meaning the redeemed and restored. What are they going to do? They're going to rebuild the ancient ruins. They're going to raise up what's been devastated. They are going to repair the ruined cities. They're going to renew the desolation of many generations. That was God's design. That's why he planted them there. And that's why he has the apostolically spirit to play their role, to make sure that something can happen so they can achieve their destiny and make sure that they don't get in the way. Number five is we're kingdom committed. That means that we expect the gospel to transform individuals and families and communities. And that was what exactly the gospel was designed to do. And that idea has been largely lost, especially in the West. So Jesus, if you read Matthew, you get first the genealogy, then you get the birth, then you get the baptism, then you get the temptation, now he's ready to go. So what does he do? Matthew chapter 4. He goes into all the towns and villages and begins to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. We're not talking about the death, burial, and resurrection. That comes way down the road when he reveals that to the disciples. What is he talking about? He is saying the king has returned to reclaim what is rightfully his and to destroy the works of the devil that have ruined everything and enslaved everyone. And it starts today. 
And from here, it will continue, as Daniel prophesied, to be that stone that grew to fill the whole earth. And the promise is that the kingdom of God will never stop increasing. That is the gospel of the kingdom that can not only save your soul, but change your circumstances. And there's no Pollyanna here that says you, you wave the magic wand and everything is fixed. The world is broken, but it doesn't mean that we are impotent to help release kingdom power change for those who are in bondage. And it is not just about saving their soul. The bumper sticker for modern Christianity is Jesus saves. The words that change the world are Jesus is Lord. Because when people align with the will of God that's been revealed in the word of God, then he does what he promised to do, which is release the power and the blessing. And things actually practically change. That is exactly what God designed and therefore our fifth value is that we are kingdom committed. And it's in the shared mission. We're going to catalyze DMM everywhere. And it's in the shared values that we've listed off that we find a common culture. And in that common culture, it's what holds us together like glue. It will unify us in a way that supersedes all of our differences. All of those things become subordinate to what holds us together. You become one worldwide family. Many ministries that have different names, but they have one heart, one great global tribe that share one vision and one purpose and one process. We call it disciple-making movements. And as we catalyze DMM everywhere, it will always be utterly familiar at its core while always unique in its expression because diversity is infinite. And if you go one size fits all, you lose. You cannot go one size fits all, but you also cannot do violence to the essence. What is there that reflects that core DNA of the kingdom has to always be there. Roy and I put together a video compilation of amazing grace around the world to make a point. So we have the symphony, we have the classical guitar, we have the Jamaican steel drums, and we have the bagpipes from Scotland. Our friend David Foster here. You know what? When the clip comes on, it doesn't matter where in the world you're listening to, you instantly know it's amazing grace. But it carries all the richness and all the variance and all the flavor and all the difference in tempo and arrangement that reflects what is meaningful and preferential without doing violence to the essence. That's what it has to look like. And it's going to always be familiar, but always unique in its expression. There's no curriculum. There's no methodology. There is no system that's going to last more than a few generations. It doesn't work that way, because that's not how humans are wired. The only hope of creating a legacy of the kingdom that will endure for a thousand generations is a DNA that is totally clear and always present and always transferred. That is where the game is won or lost. And God showed us how to do it. He put it in the scripture as a template, and he wants us to pay attention to the template because the template is what's going to work and nothing else will. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. It's called the Shema. And the Shema was something that every Orthodox Jewish family would repeat every day. And it would start with this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. He goes on to say, This commandment that the Lord commanded me to teach you, so you will teach your son who will teach your grandson. Me, you, son, grandson. 
four generations, it doesn't mean to stop there. It's giving us the model set as it has to keep on going through that transfer. It's going to go from me to you, you to your son, son to grandson, so that you will keep all of his commandments all of your days. And if you do that, it's going to go really well for you, and you're going to increase greatly. Isn't that what movements are all about? You want to see that great increase? Here's how you get there. You root that DNA. You infuse it in the soul so that it is always present and always transferred. And that is job one. Anything else that gets in the way of that is actually a distraction that's going to take you off course and ultimately reduce the impact. We see this four generation ex exposure here. We get the mirror image, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to the faithful men, faithful men to others, multiple, who all point in different directions and launch different streams to keep the process going. God is looking for chain reactions, and he has designed a process to make it true. So how are we going to do it? The Shema goes on to say, you love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Because that is where the epicenter, everything revolves around that. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will. And if you do it for any other reason, if it's out of duty, if it's out of fear, if it's out of a desire for a reward, it will not last long and it will not transfer well. The only thing you can pass on is passion. If you help people love God so that they are willing to do whatever it takes, then you can trust that it's going to last long and stay strong. Without that, it's over. So what do you do to make it true? You repeat these things diligently to your sons and your grandsons when they sit down, when they walk, when they lie down and when they rise up. You put it on the back of the head and the front of the head. You stick it on the doorpost and on the gate and you can summarize that by saying every day in every way you reinforce the DNA. Because if you don't, it will drift because that is human nature. There is nothing that stays on the center line Everything goes downhill naturally. The stuff that goes uphill and stays on course is because somebody had the re fierce resolve to make it so. We're here for one last thing. We're here to energize, to energize your imagination that it can be done. Because the truth is, most people stop believing that. They didn't believe it's true because they were honest enough to look at the facts. And the fact says what we're doing, flat takes too long, it costs too much, it stops too short, it doesn't reproduce, it doesn't create leaders, and so forth and so on. I've got a list of 20 of those. And if you get serious about all those barriers and look and see if the answer is forthcoming and you don't hear it, you start to lose hope. You might have your game face on outside, but inside you start to shrivel because you don't believe it's true, and you wonder why. You want to re-energize your imagination that it can be done. We did a census of the workforce of new generations around the world. It's well over 23,000, it's 23,500 and something. And you know what? In whatever corner of the field they're laboring in, they need to know that it's not just there, that it's starting to to get its roots and starting to produce its fruit. They need to know that it's working right now today among Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and animists and atheists. It's working in the urban and in the rural. It's working with the illiterate and the literate. It's working in places of freedom and persecution, dozens of countries, hundreds of cultures and language. Brothers and sisters, it's working. We're not talking theory. This is not the beta test. We're not hoping for the best. You're witnessing the cloud, the size of a man's hand, and you know the big rain is coming. Those days are among us now, and it can be done. 
This is clear evidence that the promise of Isaiah 35, streams in the desert, will produce what? They will produce a harvest. The desert will bloom. Why? Because the seeds are there and they need the water from you. This is clear evidence that the Spirit of God is authoring a new era of his work upon the earth. And we get to help write some of the early paragraphs on those first few pages because the Spirit of God is choosing to make it true. There's 10 seismic shifts that are happening right now today that I'm gonna share with you that you need to be aware of because what it does, it puts together a mosaic that says God is doing something new and it has the potential, the nuclear power embedded within it to actually practically complete the Great Commission not just preacher talk. Here's the 10. We're moving from professional to ordinary. People like Margaret. We're moving from a focus on knowledge to a focus on obedience. And with that, God releases the power and the blessing. We're moving from painfully slow to encouragingly fast. We're moving from scandalously expensive, ridiculously, overwhelmingly expensive to actually being cost effective. We're moving from addition to replication. And remember, that means the process goes with it. We're moving from a focus on quantity to the fusion of quality with quantity so they can never be separated. We're moving from a gospel that is spoken by strangers to good news you receive from friends and family. We're moving from the vast percentage of God's people being spectators on the sidelines to the majority being participants in the cause of the king. We're moving from a wait until you're trained and sent to share what you know today and we're moving from a gospel that has been incredibly encumbered with all sorts of et cetera's that somebody wanted to attach to a gospel that is discovered as individuals hear what God said and choose to respond to him and not anybody else. Those things are already in motion and they are a seismic shift. Things are beginning to move. And if you're sensitive enough, you can feel the ground moving. You can hear the rumble. The days are not coming. The days are here. Why are we here? We are here to celebrate. We're here to harmonize. And we are here to energize. And I'm going to pray that God sinks these into your souls. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus that good seed would find good soil. And that, Lord, you by your spirit would water it. You would change the mind and the imagination. That, Lord, you would help us to see what has clearly been defined and help us to embrace it. Father, help us to make it like your music, which always has the same heart and yet has different ways to express it. Father God, we pray that, Lord, whatever the enemy has built as an obstacle in our mind that says it can't be done, will now be cast out and it'll be replaced with a passionate proclamation that it will be done right here, right now, and that it will spread through ordinary people in their natural networks to every place that has been untouched on this earth. Father God, make it happen in our days and use us as you will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.